Although we commonly represent molecules in two dimensions on pieces of paper or computer screens, the third dimension is essential for a complete understanding of chemical reactivity and structure. Consider first this representation of a carbocationic intermediate in an SN1 reaction. This two-dimensional representation lacking wedges and dashes does not depict any three-dimensional information at all, and at first glance, the direction of approach of the nucleophile to the cation doesn't seem to matter. No matter how the nucleophile approaches, the structure of the resulting product appears to be the same. But when we add wedges and dashes to include information about the third dimension to this otherwise flat representation, we can see that the association of the nucleophile establishes a new stereocenter, and there are two distinct directions of approach of the nucleophile that result in two different diastereomeric products. However, it's not exactly clear which of the two approaches is more favorable at this stage. Passing now to an interactive three-dimensional model, we can see that the face of the carbocation on the same side as the one carbon bridge is severely blocked. The other face of the carbocation is relatively free. Using the relative steric hindrance of the two faces, we can explain the stereoselectivity of the reaction observed in practice. Similar arguments may be made for stereoselective enzyme-catalyzed reactions, in which the enzyme may selectively block one face or functional group of a similarly reacting pair. Stereoselectivity arguments are only one application of interactive three-dimensional models for organic and bioorganic chemistry. Three-dimensional models may also be used to explain reactivity, for instance, in this example of a selective 1-2 rearrangement step. A straightforward 2D drawing suggests that either hydrogen or carbon can migrate to produce a resonance stabilized cation. However, only carbon migrates in practice. How can we explain this observation? Well, if we examine the molecular orbitals of the intermediate in a three-dimensional image, we can see that the orbitals that must overlap, the empty atomic orbital of the carbocation and the sigma CH orbital, are really perpendicular to one another and don't overlap at all. The sigma CC orbital, on the other hand, is nicely aligned for overlap with the cation's empty atomic orbital. Three-dimensional models of enzymes derived from crystallographic or computational data can be useful for determining the amino acid side chains involved in an enzyme's mechanism. The idea behind this is fairly straightforward. If we can crystallize the enzyme with its substrate, or a closely related analog, in the active site, the amino acid residues near the ligand are most likely to participate in the enzyme's mechanism. For example, in this crystal structure of lanosterol synthase, we find a histidine residue in close proximity to a site where positive charge is likely to develop as the substrate cyclizes onto itself through a series of AE steps. Based on this crystal structure, it's reasonable to propose that the histidine may play a stabilizing role through an ion-dipole interaction. This webcast has introduced you to a few applications of three-dimensional models for organic chemistry. For the visualization challenge in your Momodak project, you'll want to think about this in the context of your own topic and the kinds of problems and questions that three-dimensional models can help you answer on your Momodak page.